Hello, I'm Alexia, and let me help you to take the fear out of birth with a mix of real-life positive birth stories and birthing experts sharing their wisdom. I'll also be sharing techniques for getting into the fearless birthing mindset. And join the Fearless Mumership community for bonus podcast episodes, access to free birth preparation downloads, and loads more stuff to help you to prepare for a positive birth. Join today at fearfreechildbirth.com. Hello and welcome to the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. This is me, your host, Alexia Leach, and thank you so much for joining me today. Now, today's episode is all about twins, triplets, multiples, whatever you want to call it. It's basically for mums who are expecting multiples. Now, today I'm going to be speaking to Mars Lord. Now, Mars is a UK-based doula. She also trains doulas and she's also a mum of twins. And Mars's work as a doula is she specialises in supporting expecting parents of multiples. So she has got a ton of experience as well as her own experience of birthing twins to share with you today. Now, let me just tell you, she is about to share a ton of gold, whether you're expecting multiples or just expecting one. So if you're thinking, oh, I'm not expecting twins, I'm not going to listen to this. No, stay with us, stay with us, because stuff that she is sharing is useful for those expecting just the one baby too. And she is, to be honest, an absolute delight to listen to. As I've been sitting here today, re-listening to the episode and editing it and preparing it to get out, I've had an absolute ball just listening to it all over again. So I think you are going to love it because Mars is an absolute superstar. So during our chat, there's going to be so much that we we talk about, but she talks about her own twin birth experience. Then she talks about you know, handling your pregnancy as someone who's expecting multiples. And then we also talk about the post-birth period as well, including breastfeeding and how to get the support you need after baby has arrived. So it really is a jam-packed episode if you are somebody who is expecting multiples. So listen up, here's the time that I spoke to Mars Lord. Right, welcome, Mars, to the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. Thank you for so much for joining me today. Oh, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me. We've already just been chinwagging a lot about your name, which is fantastic. And I think I'd just like to share a little bit with the listeners. We've got Mars Lord on, and you are named, you've named yourself after the planet. Is that right? I have. Nice and fiery. Yes. Strong and fierce. I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, you are a doula. Now, just tell us a bit more about you as a doula, because I'd love for the listeners to hear it from you, Mars. So just tell us a little bit about who you are. Okay, so as you know, I'm Mars Lord and I'm a birth and postnatal doula. And I also now run preparation courses for uh, encouraging women to become new doulas. I've been a doula for, gosh, well, it feels like all of my life now. I used to, I always used to say that I didn't know what I wanted to be until I grew up and then I became a doula and I went, ah, that's it. So I became a doula because I'm nosy. One of the <laughs> at school, I'd had the twins. My twins are about to be 13. And I was at one of the coffee mornings, mostly because it, I wanted someone else to hold babies. And I wanted to drink a cup of tea or coffee without holding a baby. And um, she said that she was a doula. And I couldn't work out what she was talking about. And she, she wasn't actually talking to me. She talked to someone else. It's where the nosy comes in. And I went forward and I asked what a doula was. And she told me, and I thought, well, I've been at the birth of my niece. I've been at the birth of my friend's son. I didn't know you could do that for a living. Uh, being a midwife holds no interest for me. I love midwives. I think they're amazing. Don't want to be one. Love what I do. So I went and I did my first birth. And I remember I remember being really sort of clear and practical about it, thinking, right, I'm going to do this doula preparation course. And if I do three births, that will pay for it. So if I don't like it, it's only three births. So I did the first birth and I remember arriving at the hospital, me, mum and dad, having spent some time with them at home, pouring water over her back and reading uh, Hamlet while she was in the bath because I love reading and my reading has a theme you'll discover. Um, we arrived at the hospital, and I remember she got out of the car and had this almighty contraction, and two midwives were on their way out. One of them ran to open the door, and another one grabbed a wheelchair and tried to put her in it, and she couldn't sit in his wheelchair, and sort of flung us through the door and said goodbye because they were on their final shift at that hospital and were going off for drinks. So 
in their glad rags. So we waved them goodbye and we went in and 45 minutes later, her son was born. Now they were friends of mine. And her husband said to me at the beginning, the only reason we want you as our doula is because we know you've, you've done this training and you need to get some practice and because you're a friend of ours, but we don't really need a doula. So I remember after their son was born, he grabbed me and he said, how the hell did we do this without you? The <laughs> and I thought, okay. And I felt, wow. And then I did the next birth and the next birth. And here I am 11 years later thinking, wow, still. Yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing. 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 Now you mentioned that you had twins. So um, I'd love us to talk more about that because I've got loads of mums listening that are expecting twins. And I've even had some listeners emailing me go, like, you know, when she's had a, a, a fertility journey that hasn't always been pleasant for her. And then she emailed me going, I've got triplets coming. And I remember thinking, oh, my word, thinking, good yeah. luck, honey, because I can't even imagine that for a minute. And and you work a lot with women uh, that are expecting multiple. So, but I think yeah. it'd be really great to hear your own kind of twin journey. So would you mind just sort of sharing a little bit more I, about you? My, my twin journey, um, another sort of running theme with me is alcohol. We were... <laughs> on holiday in Spain and we were drinking champagne sangria and we decided that we'd have a fourth baby because we already had three at this point. And then we came home and thought that actually really we've had three babies and three's enough. We can't really afford another one. And yeah, then of so course... That sounds like a classic drunk idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then um, I kept feeling really tired and I remember my friend, I, I called her and said, could you come and empty my bin? Because it smells like something died. So she came in and she said, I'll change your bin if you take this pregnancy test. And I'm like, there's no way I'm pregnant. And then I did the test. I'm like, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and then, um, my cousin-in-law was going for her last antenatal as I was going for my dating scan. I said to my husband, don't come to the dating scan. There's no point in taking a, a day off of work. We know how these things work come for the big scan when you can really see something. Only scan I probably ever needed him at, really. And so the sonographer turned the screen round with the words, here they are. <laughs> what? <laughs> they are. So I went into hysterical laughter for a few weeks. I came out. My cousin thought there was something wrong with the baby because I was in sh – she said my whole face, my whole being was in shock. And then when I handed the scan pictures to um, – my husband they he just looked at them and just said what and then he didn't speak again for two weeks and his first words were hello vasectomy department <laughs> so so I was pregnant with the twins and because I'd been pregnant before I wasn't particularly bothered about it I was quite excited about having twins and half of me was thinking oh crap I've got three kids why am I having two more this is now five children who has five children yeah no you are certifiably mad <laughs> yes but <laughs> But you see, in my journey, I have met women with six, seven, no, I know. nine and ten children. Oh. So I'm total lightweight. <laughs> and I say that, man, but I just think I have utmost honour. I mean, I just think about how crazy it can be two and I just think, oh, my good, three and, and four and five. I mean, I, I imagine that after a while it's, it, it doesn't make another difference when there's another one because they all start looking after themselves. But this yes. is me speaking to The twins from... have basically brought themselves up from birth. Yeah. I mean, making their own breakfast at three, not because I'm this amazing mother that taught them how to do anything, <laughs> but I just wanted that extra half hour in bed. I could <laughs> clean the kitchen. That was, that was fine. And I knew it would be messy. But those extra 30 minutes in bed. And then... So my pregnancy was, oh, I was okay. I had a form of hyperemesis. I had a, a thing called, please don't eat whilst listening to this. I had a thing called petialism, which is an overproduction of saliva. And it's a form of hyperemesis gravidium. So I couldn't eat anything because it made me sick. Um, but my mouth was constantly full of saliva. And people would say, well, why didn't you swallow? And I couldn't swallow because that would make me sick. So I was constantly spitting. And it's something that seems to be quite common in African and African-Caribbean women. Um, it's not exclusive to us, I'm sorry to say. Um, and I remember seeing my doctor and she said, oh, you poor love. And then going back to see her a few weeks later, she said, do you know, after you came in, three more women came in with it. So I knew what to do. But the only thing to do was spit, basically. So you might see some women carrying covered jars that they spit into. And it's not that they like carrying their saliva around. It's just that unlike me, they didn't 
think it was the right thing to do to spit on the ground. I used to, do, I used to, I hate people spitting in the street, and I became the spitter in the street. <laughs> so I went through the pregnancy, and you know, couldn't particularly go anywhere because I was just so ill and so depleted. But you know, and I won't tell you what I ate because my doctors made me promise never to tell people that the three things that I could keep down are three of the things they tell you you absolutely mustn't eat when you're pregnant. So I'll keep, I'll, I'll chill. Raw fish, my- steak oh. and egg. <laughs> uh, two of them were alcoholic. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> because water didn't work. And so anyway, so my consultant was lovely. She's really lovely. She was fully expecting me to give birth vaginally. Uh, 17 weeks, I developed hypertension. My blood pressure went through the roof. Uh, they monitored me. Then I needed to go on medication because it was just sky high. It wasn't high, it was sky high. But we were still on course for a vaginal birth. And then as I hit 36 weeks, just before I hit 36 weeks, even on the medication, it was climbing again. So they were worried that I would develop preeclampsia. So I ended up having a, a planned cesarean. Because uh, my, as my doctor said, hmm, if I thought they'd just come, she said, we'd induce and you could go for it vaginally. She said, but your levels keep rising and the babies are unstable. So whenever anyone tells me that twins can't turn after 35, 36 weeks, I think add expletive um, right there. <laughs> because, you know, mine were, I got scanned four times because my surgery kept getting pushed back. First time in the morning, they're both head down. And my doctor said, all right, we'll see how they're doing when we're ready to go in for the op. And if they're still head down, then we'll try inducing. And then when they scanned me an hour and a half later, one was head down, one was bum down. And then they scanned me again, and they were in a different position. And she just said, do you know what? They're spinning like tops. She said, <laughs> option is just to take them out. She said, because I cannot tell how either of them will present were you to give birth vaginally and so I had a planned cesarean of the twins which was um, good because I understood why and I knew it was a medical necessity with my blood pressure and not so good because I was really looking forward to just uh, popping them out and <clears throat> being up on my feet again sooner rather than later but maybe that was the blessing because <laughs> yeah. I in my rocking chair with a cushion a baby attached to each boob watching the most awful american soap sunset beach it was so terrible that it was brilliant <laughs> um, in fact it meant that i missed the entire defor genocide because i was just locked on my chair baby on a boo beach and watching sunset beach so the world outside just vanished <laughs> terrible so how was that that kind of new mum I'm not even going to ask about the other three, just just handling kind of two, one on each boob, uh, I don't know, sleeping. I, I did, how on earth did you not, like, I don't know, fall apart? The hardest thing was was actually dealing with the healthcare professionals. So because my blood pressure was high, I had to stay in hospital for a week after the twins were born. And um, they were mostly, the first midwife was a bit, oh, but then I met a lovely midwife and they moved me into a room and, and that got easy but getting out of hospital was difficult there's an assumption that this that when you have twins that um they need to be constantly checked for things if they were born at the same size of a singleton and it was just one baby you wouldn't get half the heel pricking and testing that you do with twins and there's they have a, a way of assuming that the smaller twin is somehow deficient if they're not exactly the same size or within an ounce or so of each other. So when I finally escaped the hospital, because I'd been really happy all the way through, and then um, I was told that, yes, you'll probably be discharged today, and then the midwife said, no, your blood pressure's still too high. So like a mature adult, I turned my back on her, put my head under the pillow and howled. So she panicked because they'd only ever seen me happy, tired, but happy. So the registrar came in and made me promise to uh, call 999 if I had any one of five symptoms because preeclampsia doesn't end when you have a baby. The word pre doesn't mean pre-pregnancy or pre-birth. It can still happen up to a few weeks later. So I got home and that was great and the family were great. And like I said, I had three big kids, a baby to this one, a baby to that one, gave me a cup of tea to the other one type thing. 
And then the midwife came and the first things she said to me were that I shouldn't be out of hospital because my blood pressure was too high and that my house must be hell because it was half term, five kids, you know. And then the second thing she told me was, um, how are you feeding those babies? I said, I'm breastfeeding. She said, you can't breastfeed twins. And if I, my birth knowledge, my breastfeeding knowledge is stuff that I got after I became a doula. As a mum, I just kind of got on with it. I wasn't an NCT girl. I didn't even know what NCT was. I remember Jake starting school and people saying, yeah, we've been friends since NCT. And I'd be like, what is that? I don't know because I didn't have a clue. But because I knew that I could breastfeed, I'd breastfed my others. And because I knew that I could breastfeed because I was breastfeeding the twins, she could have destroyed me with that one sentence telling me that there's no way I could breastfeed because it's twins. But of course what the science tells me and what I know with the knowledge that I have now is I have two breasts. Each woman is designed to breastfeed twins. And the more you feed your baby, the more milk you produce. So it makes sense to me that if you've got two babies and they're sucking on the breasts all the time, then you'll always have milk. If you have three babies, you just sort of do a sort of conveyor belt. See, I knew the word would come. And you just sort of move them around and you keep going and you have someone else that helps. And women have exclusively breastfed triplets to six plus months. But Mm. there's an assumption that you can only breastfeed one Mm. and there's no way you'll make enough. And it's like that stupid thing when your baby, you've been feeding your baby beautifully and someone says to you, your baby's too big to be breastfed. There's no way your milk can sustain your baby. And I think, well, the milk grew him. So if it grew him to this stage, I'm guessing it can sustain him. So she she was quite dangerous for me, or would have been dangerous for me if I didn't already have the self-confidence mm. in my feeding. Mm. But um, because I'm a sweet, kind, gentle kind of woman, yes, when yes. she told me all of that, I asked her two questions. I said, how long, how many visits do you have to make and how long do you have to stay? She said, we don't have to visit any more than you want and I um, and it doesn't have to be a long visit at all. You you know, it, I don't have to stay. I said, lovely, let me show you the door. Because there's no point in having someone in my home who's going to destroy my confidence at a point when I'm at my most vulnerable, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just yeah. feeding these babies, getting to know them. We're out of the hospital. They're at home. Now I've got to keep them alive myself without a doctor or a midwife to swoop in and save me. And, you know, so I didn't need that with me. And the big kids kind of loved them. And it, it it was all right. It was blooming exhausting. But it was all right. And so what I tell all of my clients who are having multiples is people love helping when it's twins. People love helping. Let them. Get a box. Fill it full of postcards, A5 cards, with all the jobs that you want done on it. Someone somewhere loves cleaning toilets. Put it all in the box. <laughs> say, what can I do? To help them to take their pick through the box to do a job for you. Because people do want to help. But get good support and good help when it comes to things like feeding the babies and what you do about babies sleeping, etc. Because everyone and his mother's got a story. And if once you're pregnant with twins, everyone and his mother knows someone who knows someone who knows someone who's best friends with someone who lives next door to someone who had twins. And it was hell. <laughs> and you think, what? Why 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 should this be horrible? And lots of people will, when they find out you're pregnant with twins, they'll recoil in horror and shock. And it's hard to find someone that just walks up and says, oh, that's fantastic. Not, I wish I had twins, but that's fantastic. What a blessing. How amazing. And not a lot of people say that. I do, because I think it's, I just think it's great fun. So you now work with parents expecting multiples. So just for somebody listening to the podcast who is expecting twins or triplets or or even more, um, I would imagine, like you, at that scan, they, you know, they come away thinking, holy moly, how yeah. am I going to deal with this? And so what's that? Is there anything that you can share for them that like sort of help them on that, that pregnancy journey? Because I would imagine yeah. that, you know, even when you're pregnant with just one, you get a lot of, depending on who you land in the healthcare system that you're in, you might get some quite a lot of fear-based messages coming towards you. And I would imagine with twins that that kind of escalates onto a whole new level. It, it certainly does. 
So, first of all, allow yourself the time to go, holy moly, <laughs> go, yes, we've got <laughs> twins, and revel in that innocence. Um, <laughs> really, enjoy, really enjoy that time. And then do your research, find out. So a common assumption is that twins will come early and you will have a cesarean section. You will need to be monitored. You will need to have an epidural. You will need to birth in hospital. These are common assumptions and people say, it. strangers will tell you on the street that that's how it works. It doesn't have to work like that. How would you like to birth your twins? Start to think about it. You actually have to start thinking about it as a twin parent earlier than someone else does. And find good information. What's going to work for you? What don't you want? So I had a beautiful client, and she'd she'd had one before, a singleton baby. And she called me, and I'd supported her with the vest, and she called me, and she said, oh, it's twins. Oh, my goodness. My cesarean. And I said, you're what? She said, my cesarean's booked on this date. And I said, why are you having a cesarean? She said, because it's twins. And I said, and? She said, well, because it's twins. And I said, but what's the reason for having the cesarean? She said, well, my doctor told me I have to have a cesarean. And I said, why? And she said, oh. So she went away and thought about it. And she came back and she called me again. She said, I don't need to have a cesarean, do I? I said, well, you know, you birthed your first one really easily. So why wouldn't you? birth two relatively easily so when she crafted her birth plan and I say you know I'm not I, I'm not a you must have a vaginal birth the world will end if you don't I think all women should if they can and if they want to but on her birth plan she said you know if for any reason the things that I want are not medically advisable or contraindicated by a medical situation please talk to us so that we're involved in the decision but yes absolutely we're going to go down that route and she ended up having a, a a beautiful physiological birth where she only had handheld monitoring because she didn't want to be fully monitored the entire time she wanted the freedom to move and eat and drink she didn't have an epidural just in case because, again, she wanted to move and be free. And the first baby came so quickly that the midwife missed it. <laughs> That's brilliant. She was, she was on the bed, so she picked up. So the first baby came and she picked the baby up. And then the second baby came in the call. So she had identical twins in two separate sacks. Wow. Second baby came in the call. And, in fact, um, I remember as, as he came out, or as the call came out, she gave me this funny look and said, I can feel he's not out. And I said, not yet. And she said, well, I said, that's the call. And then the baby came out in the call and sort of landed beautifully on the bed. And then she put her hands down as the sack opened and she picked up her baby. And I have to say, in over a decade, that's the first time I've seen a twin mum be the first person to touch both of her babies. Oh, wow. How precious. But, you know, but so... We worked together quite a lot from the beginning. We talked about what are the considerations. So when you found out you're pregnant with twins, everyone tells you that you're high risk, you're high risk. And when you hear the word risk, you think, oh, my God, all these things are going to go wrong. But a word I prefer to use, um, and this is me, and I'm not saying that everyone has to use it, but it'd be great if they did, is considerations. So you're pregnant with twins, so there are some considerations. So there are things to think about. What are the things you need to think about? Where are you going to have your baby? Are you going to have your baby at home? Your babies at home. Are you going to have your babies in the hospital? Will you use an independent midwife? Will you do it at home with an NHS midwife? Or will you do it in the hospital with an NHS midwife? Will you do it in a private hospital with an obstetrician? When you're pregnant with twins, you go under consultant-led care immediately. But that doesn't mean the end of your vaginal birth because you can still give birth vaginally of twins. You open and the first baby comes. In rare instances, it closes back down, but often it just stay, you stay open and dilated. And the second baby, when the second baby's ready, comes. The second baby doesn't always follow immediately afterwards because your body sort of goes, oh, I just birthed me a human. <laughs> and then the contractions might go off for a while and then come back up. 
But when should you have that second twin? Different hospitals have different protocols. Now, a protocol is not a medical reason. That's a guideline. This is how we like to do things. Well, how does that suit you and your babies and your birth? If it's a guideline, then it means there are things that you can do around it. We use the word allow a lot in birth. It's like we will allow you to do what with your own body? You know, this is my body. These are my babies. I choose to move freely. I choose to eat. I choose to have an epidural and just, you know, push my babies out vaginally under anesthetic. That's fine, but it's up to you what you choose to do with your body. So what are your considerations? How am I going to feed these babies? What pain management do I leave? All the things that you think about when you have one baby, you think about with two. But if you're really blunt about it, the fact is you simply have two babies or three babies in your womb. Mm. And so you birth them. I was there, uh, what was I watching? I was, oh, I was watching this fabulous thing that's just started on the telly the other day. This is us. And it shows this birth of triplets. And I remember thinking, every time, I don't like the way they depict birth in America, head down screaming and everyone goes bonkers. But all the twin and triplet births that I've seen on American shows are all done vaginally. All of them. Oh, how interesting. And I, keep, I always sit back and sort of pause the TV and go, no way. <laughs> There's no way you can have triplets vaginally, and yet you can. But there are more considerations, the positions of the babies, how the babies are doing as you're labouring, which is why it's good to be able to move around to let gravity help these babies on their way. But, you know, I'm not a, I, I'm not someone who says that you mustn't, you can't, you shouldn't use pain management techniques or pain relief because it's not my birth and these are not my babies mm. but if it's not what you want to do then why would you do it unless you change your mind or feel that you need to mm. unless there's a medical need like you said there's a medical need and again my favorite saying with twins and this is sarcasm is um we need to induce them early because twins come early and i don't understand the logic if they're going to come early, then you don't need to induce them because they're going to come early. And surely we should give them as much time as possible in the womb. You know, and I mean, twins are sort of 50% likely. You've got a chance of coming before 32 weeks anyway. So you want to do what you can to encourage them to stay in. And I do, I mean, again, personal thought, no no science, nobody go and quote me and say this is scientifically true, but I'm reasonably convinced that the multiples come early because they're hungry, because it's so hard, there's so little space for your stomach. I'll never forget going out with a friend to my favourite burger place, getting really excited at the burger being put down in front of me and getting ready to eat this thing and the little blight has shifted right onto my stomach and I lost my appetite in an instant. No way. <laughs> so that, that it was, I remember it. And the reason I was so upset was it was one of the few days in my pregnancy that I was able to leave the house and I wanted to eat food. <laughs> little blight has moved. But, you know, so eat well and drink well. I've had women go to sort of 41 weeks with twins. Wow that eat well and drink well. But you don't hear about twins getting to 41 weeks because doctors like to induce them early. So you look after lots of mums expecting twins and triplets. So how, you know, it sounds to me like actually just treating this like a like we would any pregnancy, like any yeah. expectant mum would, mm -hmm. even whether she's having one or two or three, and, and just be open-minded, do your research, be clear about your, what you want, and yeah. again, only veer from that if there's a medical need. It sounds like the same rules apply. Just maybe get savvy Absolutely. on different things. Yeah. And, you know, and again, there are considerations. So someone right now is going, yes, but I've got identical twins that share a sac and a placenta and you can't have those vaginally. Well, yes, you can. But you may not choose to. But one of the considerations with twins that are sharing or triplets that are sharing a placenta it's twin to twin transfusion syndrome. And that's something that they're slowly learning about. They don't know why it happens. There's no specific time when it happens. And um, I, I know that doctors like to get those twins out 
by about 36, 37 weeks because of the worry of twin to twin transfusion. But with all the checks that you get, you can see if one baby is growing more than another. And actually the worry is for the twin that's taking on too much blood rather than the, the smaller one. So it's a consideration. So as you go along, as long as you and the babies are healthy and happy, but it's the same as if you have a singleton, as long as you and your baby are healthy and happy, just keep trotting on the way you want to trot on. But mm. it's a bit more of a battle when it's twins. In the same way that for women that were having VBACs, vaginal births after cesarean, it was a it, for a long time it was a battle to get a vaginal birth after a cesarean. Now the studies are all showing that it's safer to have a vaginal birth rather than have a cesarean after cesarean. And so now the doors are open and people are more encouraging of women to have vaginal births. And I feel in some ways that multiple birth is like the next taboo, the next wall to be breached. Mm -hmm. But I'm really hopeful because the healthcare professionals, so I said right at the beginning that the hardest thing for me were the healthcare professionals, but they are becoming so much more woman-centered so for all the ones that are moving towards a hugely medical model, there is a whole sway of midwives and consultants, obstetricians and pediatricians that are becoming more woman centered and seeing it as actually this isn't a medical procedure I have to do to you to enable you to have your babies. But this is you, woman, birthing your child, your children, and I'm here to support and to help. And so there's a slow increase in the number of vaginal births of twins as people are beginning to say, actually, do you know, it's just as safe to give birth vaginally as it is via cesarean. And I think, I hope that with the triplets, that same message will keep creep through. Mm -hmm. But remember, I'm not a diehard vaginal physiological birth kind of girl. I mean, I wish, I wish that every woman could have that but that's why we have doctors and that's why we have some of the intervention the interventions that we have now they're used a bit too standard but they came about really to help save lives mm -hmm. so if the consideration means actually this would be too dangerous for you and all your babies of course you listen. Of course you listen and make your decision. Now, I'm curious as to how, how you know, we, we uh, when you're pregnant with one, you kind of, one thing I did a lot of was like trying to research how long labour might last. How long am I going to kind of handle this for? So I'm just wondering how long or what effect does expecting more than one have on labour? And I know, I mean, labour can last anything from 20 minutes to four days. So I realise it's a really difficult question to answer, but... I don't know, like, what kind of impact does it have on the length of labour for a woman? Yeah, you know, some uh, there's a, there's an assumption that the first twin will come and the second twin will come shooting out straight afterwards. I did a lovely twin birth where um, she was just under 36 weeks and the waters had gone uh, fraternal twins, so separate sex and so separate water. And the presenting twins' waters went, and she went into labour. They called me and I, I went over to see them. Um, and she'd been checked at home because she'd wanted to have a home birth. But they, you know, they'd agreed that they wouldn't. But the hospital had agreed to send someone around to assess her so that she didn't go into hospital too early. And she was 10 centimetres. So they phoned me going, yeah, she's 10 centimetres run. So I was sort of, you know, the waters have gone. I'm casually strolling over and now it's a run. So we arrive at the hospital and after a couple of hours, the first baby is born. And, you know, lovely, lovely team. I remember um, at the time she had, she was told she had to give birth in theatre. And that's something nice. They're starting to bring twin births out of theatre now. But the obstetrician turned off all the machines, put a sheet up on the window, because when it's twins, when it's multiples, all the students, everyone wants to peep in and have a see. So everything was covered. And the obstetrician and the midwife are sat there with their hands in their laps, just waiting, just allowing this baby to come. So the first baby comes. And I'm sure that the second baby's up, they go, no, no, your waters went, not mine, because he didn't come for hours. He said, no, I'm very happy here. I'm quite warm. So they ended up, after a couple of hours, they said, look, we, we'd really quite like to get the second twin out. 
would you object to us putting up some syntocin on? So she said, okay, if that's what you're going to do, that's fine. So they put the syntocin on up um, and they kept saying, can you feel these contractions? And she was one of those women that's, you know, that the waves go over her. And she said, no, not really. And so they put it up and put it up and they said, you sure you don't need any? And she said, no, it's fine. But they could see the contractions were ramping up. And after about another hour and a half, the baby, I saw the baby went, oh, stop it. <laughs> and then he came. And when he came out, I remember, I remember the look on his face. I was like, I was really warm and comfortable. So I don't know what you're doing. So her labor really was six, seven hours. But I've been with others where their labor has been a couple of days. It's just the same as with singletons. How long is a piece of string? We don't know how long your labor is going to be. I've had two singleton women who I caught their babies at home. And they both told me mm. quite clearly, categorically, Mars, love you, love what you stand for, know why we have a doula, going in for an epidural. Fine, I said, if that's what we're doing, that's what we're doing. I arrive at the house, they're labouring away gently. How are you doing? Oh, Mars is holding a baby because suddenly you're pushing and I'm sat underneath it and, you're holding, and they're like, oh my God, I was going to do this in hospital. We don't know. The twist I told you about at the beginning, she'd been in hospital less than 40 minutes. So what kind of gap might i know again impossible to say but i'm thinking it, it, what what kind of gap is there between the two arriving i mean you know some might shoot straight out but what what's the i don't know could a woman be hanging around for 10 hours waiting for the next one to make it could it fall into the next day i don't know like yeah there's a, could there's, it? Wow. a blog online in america it was a home birth of twins and if i remember rightly it was six days between the twins goodness they you know they had their separate placentas they were fine and, uh, you know, we don't tend to let people, a lot of hospital policies say that, um, that the contractions need to have started up within an hour. It's always, always worth asking for your hospital's multiple birth policy. Don't ask for a twin policy or a triplet. Ask for their multiple birth policy. And then you can see what it is they do. I suggest to my clients that what they might like to think about doing is saying as long as mum and baby are fine, we don't want any interference mm. uh, some people are very quick to uh, want to induce the second twin to keep things going uh, and if they have a concern then they'll do that as well but find out what your your hospital multiple birth policy is and decide what you want if you and the baby that that is in are fine and the baby that's out is fine do you need to change the situation immediately why not just enjoy those last moments alone with one baby <laughs> yeah. you know and do the skin to skin and let yourself be calm but surely it makes sense that a body that's been working hard and pushed out a baby will just stop for a minute and pause mm. or pause for an hour or so before the hormones start to ramp themselves up again but we're very quick to to move things along at a pace on a timetable on a schedule to make it happen yeah is that always necessary? But you have to ask the questions. So anything that I say, I tell, I say to all of my clients, to anyone that does any of my courses, look, ask the question, but trust your instinct. Does your inner say, actually, do you know what, Mars? I think that's great, but we need. I feel like we need to act now. The doctor's not going to say no. They're probably going to be really pleased if you go, yes, absolutely, give me everything you've got, because then it, it sticks according to their protocol, their guidelines, and they can sort of measure for themselves how things go. So you have to listen to yourself. But ask the question. Don't just hand yourself and your babies over to other people and just become a vessel, because we're mm. not vessels carrying babies. We're women, and as our babies are born, so are we born into our motherhood again, you know? So mm -hmm. ask the questions. What's working for you? And if you have time to wait, so if you say, what happens if we do nothing, or we wait an hour, or we wait half an hour, if you have time to wait, then there's no urgency. If there's an urgency, a true urgency, your doctor will say, that's great, but we can't. And basically, they're running you towards theatre at that point. So ask the question, what happens if we wait? What if we do nothing? Because 
ultimately the decisions are yours and no one knows your body as well as you do and you and your babies aren't generic mm. you're individual mm. brilliant i'm just thinking if there's a mum listening to this who's expecting twins there's you just shared so much gold it's brilliant thank you so much because you're welcome these are i mean i can imagine i, I get so many listeners emailing me saying that they're expecting because they literally really struggle to find really good resources or information and they just feel like they're kind of going through the rest of their pregnancy a little bit blind and there's so much information for women expecting one but when it becomes more than one it's really hard yeah so just everything that you shared already i think is really going to help uh, a mum listening is there anything else like you know i, mean, I know that the post birth is a whole new conversation oh yes but you know so look you have two babies okay so you've, you've had your babies at hospital at home wherever you are and hopefully you've gotten and fought for that golden hour where nobody does anything but the babies just stay on your skin so that they can bond and you can bond and you know and everyone can settle and get over the fact that oh my god two babies just came out of my vagina or out of my uterus virus is Aaron and you just got these two babies on you so I always suggest that um, when it comes to feeding your babies breastfeeding if you're breastfeeding your babies and you can get good support early find out beforehand you've got the association of breastfeeding mothers you've got the la leche league you've got so you've got internationally board certified lactation consultants galore get good help at the beginning and find out but i always recommend that because a baby doesn't feed so much in the first few days when you have twins don't try to do the tandem thing in hospital where you don't have as much space, you're not particularly confident and different midwives and healthcare professionals are giving you different bits of advice. Feed them one at a time. So Tarquin and Jocasta are the two names that I always use. And when I'm talking about your neighbours, they're Mabel and Ethel. Don't ask, it just came to my head. So Tarquin and Jocasta, uh, Tarquin comes out and goes to the breast and Tarquin, I'm doing it this way around because my son was this child. Tarquin's like, and Tarquin eats, and Tarquin, he got it. You don't need to teach this boy to breastfeed. He came out of the vagina going, feed me now. So Tarquin feeds really well, but Jocasta struggles a bit. And you're like, mm. but when you do them one at a time, you get to work out which one feeds well or better and which one maybe struggles. Maybe they both come out feeding well. But if you do them one at a time, you get to say, okay, so Jocasta needs fiddling with, playing with a bit more to get her latch right. And then when you come home and you've got space and you feel more relaxed because you're in your space now, try putting them both on together. Now, if they go on and you know that Jocasta doesn't feed too brilliantly, put Tarquin on the breast first. So Put Tarquin, for example, on the left breast. After a couple of minutes on the left breast, take Tarquin off. Oh, my gosh, what's she doing? What's she doing? What's she doing? Put Tarquin on the right breast. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm being fed again. Then take Jocasta and put her on the left breast because the breast has started now. And Jocasta goes on going, I can't. Oh, well, as there's milk there, I'll just feed. Because you've started the flow of milk going. And then mm -hmm. you can do it like that. But take your time. Know that... Our babies are born too soon. Oh, human babies are born too soon. Every other animal, they can get up and they can run away from predators. Ours lie on the floor going, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be eaten by lions, tigers and bears. So they want to be close to your chest because it's their survival instinct. And they want to feed. They will feed a lot in the beginning because they're trying to survive. But if you know this... Rather than thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be exhausted, I'm going to be feeding all the time, and therefore I need to do all of these other things, put your support in place. Who's feeding you? Who's watering you? Who's making sure that everything's all right? Who's going to take the babies, and initially it's the partner, and feed and change their nappies whilst you just sit back for a minute and then remember, oh, goodness, I've got to go to the toilet, and then you go to the toilet and come back and sit down. Know that for the first six to eight weeks, it's just going to be full on feed fest, but it's full on feed fest with a singleton. It's just that everyone tells you how much worse it's going to be with twins. It's not because you got the two boobs. 
but you know you've got your full-on feed fest and then it slowly starts to work out so that it feels like oh actually i can look up from the feeding but if you've got people supporting around you who will do all the other things around you then you will probably succeed better with your breastfeeding get help quickly and early if three people are telling you three different things find the voice that you trust and you want to listen to but seriously get in touch with an ibclc an internationally board certified lactation consultant no get someone who knows her stuff or his stuff and listen to them and make it work if there's a problem deal with it immediately you might find that the baby has a tongue tie or something Get it dealt with quickly. Don't wait to see because what could be fixed in five minutes, because you wait, suddenly two, three, four, five weeks, and the problem's getting worse and worse and worse. Get help quickly from good sources of help, and then you will succeed as much as you want to. If you choose to feed in a different way, then absolutely, but know how to feed safely. Know that it's not the boiling of the water that um, that makes the bottles safe. It's the having the water up at 70 degrees and adding the powder, killing the pathogens in the powder and then cooling it down for the baby to drink. So don't boil your water and leave it on the side to cool and think that that will do it because the pathogens aren't in the water, they're in the powder. So do it safely, but work out what works for you. And just because Mabel next door wouldn't be able to do it. And Ethel on the other side, well, she had to do it this way. Doesn't mean that's how it's going to work for you. So Mm -hmm. get your information, know who you're calling when you need help, and then kick back and watch something crappy like Sunset (laughs) Beach. You're not going to be doing anything else for a little wee while. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Mars, for sharing all that amazing, juicy gold stuff for mums expecting triplets twins or whatever it is really really appreciate you sharing all that and i'm sure the women listening expecting multiples really appreciate you sharing all that so thank you so much now for those that want to find out a little bit more about you mars and where they can track you down online if there's any uk based mums that are expecting trips think i want that woman to be at my birth (laughs) how can they find you okay so i have um two websites the first is www.mammydoula.com m a m m y d o u l a dot com and the second uh, where i'm doing my doula preparation and working with other doulas is www dot abuela doulas a b u e l a doulas dot com abuela is uh, spanish for grandmother and we have wisdom from our grandmothers dot com you can find me there if you google mars lord you'll find me me. (laughs) and i do also run um antenatal sessions for mums expecting multiples and for birth workers and birth keepers who are working families expecting multiples brilliant well thank you so much for sharing all that today and i'm sure that if there's any uk mums they're going to check you out for sure thank you so much once again mars for joining us for each other podcast for having me You've just been listening to me, Alexia Leachman, here on the Fear Free Childbirth Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Now, this is just a wee reminder that if you'd like to listen to bonus podcast episodes and have access to loads of birth preparation downloads, my video mini series on reducing your fears and so much more, then join the fearless mamaship community today. You can join at fearfreechildbirth.com. Until next time, bye for now.